Adagio for Things. I'm one of the three hosts, Michael, and we're breaking our format a little bit this week. For the full episode, I sit down with composer Chris Osniak's to learn a little bit more about his musical life. As a composer, Chris has a foot firmly planted in both the U.S. and Europe in terms of his compositional career. He has been written about in the New York Times and has had pieces played by several world-renowned ensembles. One of his most recent commissions is his piece Crossing that was written for the Aspen Music Festival. I hope you enjoy the interview as much as I did. Let's give it a listen. Michael, what's my, Will told me your last name, mm-hmm. but I, uh, I guess I have no idea. It begins with a V and it's the same as a first name. I don't know any name that starts with V. V. I can't think of one. Uh, you Will, know what? You're uh, <laughs> it's right. I'm very Vincent. disappointed. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, Vince. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. It's, All right. It's a yeah. really weird last name. Yeah. Like there's, there's strangely a lot of Michael Vinces, mm. but not, I don't know any other. I met one other Vince in my entire life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is really uh, exciting for me also uh, selfishly because one, I just find interviewing fun. And two, this is the first time I've interviewed someone that I don't really already know. So, so you have to introduce yourself. Uh, well, I, you have to just take it easy on me because if I mess up, <laughs> I'll just edit it out and you'll never know. Fair enough. Well, the listeners will know. So will they, 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 they can sense it. Yeah. I think they know by now that on this show, there's probably a lot of fuck ups and uh-huh. oh, that's right. We can cuss. Oh, cool. So feel free to let go. Wow. And just be foul. I see. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, how long have you lived in New York? Uh, full time a year now. Oh, re- yeah. that recently. Yeah. Wow. Well, I lived in New Haven for four years. So, uh, I was just in New Haven. What? That's really crazy. Yeah. My aunt and uncle live in Guilford. Oh, cool. So we That's took the nice. yeah. train a nice, to nice New town. Haven. Yeah. yeah. It's really nice. It's, I went there recently and it was just really interesting to be somewhere where they don't have sidewalks. So oh, I went for don't? a walk hmm. in their neighborhood and I was just walking in the street and I'm like, <laughs> What is this? Like, who dangerous. designs yeah, these that's things? Yeah, it's like Florida. I know. Which my parents live in Florida, so oh. wow. you're walking along what a part? highway on a side. They live in Naples, oh, Florida. Cool. Yeah, so my partner's from Lakeland. What are some other cities that you've been to or had? I mean, I know you, it seems like you've done a lot of different musical things in different cities. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious if you've had any other like favorite cities or things that have happened there. Uh well, I lived in New Haven for four years, mm-hmm. and I really, really loved it. Very different from uh, from New York, of course, uh, but I loved how green it was. The balance between mm-hmm. between rural and urban areas, if you will, mm-hmm. is I, I think it's a good balance. It's a little bit too small for my personal taste, but <laughs> I think for you know while I was a student, it was a great place to be. What else? Uh, I lived in The Hague for four years in Holland, uh, where I did my oh. undergrad. And oh, awesome. that was a, that was a very, very um, great place. Mm-hmm. But again, I loved it very much. I think a, there's a certain kind of restraint and there's some beauty in the austerity of, of Dutch architecture okay. and Dutch weather as well. It's very, very <laughs> austere. It's worse than London's perhaps. Oh, wow. Uh, depends who you I've ask. I've been to neither, but yes, I've seen pictures. But yeah, it's just very, uh, yeah, there are very few sunny days over the year. Mm-hmm. And the summers are short, but that being said, coming from Latvia, which is infinitely less sunny, I can't complain about anything. My life has been going up ever since more and more sunny days yeah. a year, statistically. My, you may have already touched on this a little bit, but I'm just curious, out of like all of the cities, what have you felt that you've had the most musical experience with? You know, of course, it would be really easy to say New York because of how much there's going on. Mm-hmm. That being said, I think I'm substantially older than when I when I left my home country for the first time, and I think what for me was most eye opening was actually Holland and and The Hague okay. in particular, even though it's a, a relatively small mm-hmm. small city. But I think how different it was and how much of an underground, untamed scene was mm-hmm. there that felt very, very, very special. And and that's the kind of time you can't relive, right? That's my late teenage years, eighteen to twenty two. There's a certain True. kind of beauty within yourself, certain mm. kind of search and, and lack of answers, lack of definitiveness of any sort. 
that makes I, I think it would make the smallest place in the world beautiful. Mm -hmm. You threw me a curveball there. I definitely was guessing New York, but I think that is very true. I feel like some of the best memories you have, and I feel like it's a lot of the reason why people have fondness for their old small towns. Where, but there's always that sense of fondness. I think <laughs> the past and those experiences and how much it did mean to uh -huh. to to people.、Um, but again, I'm of course tying together a time of someone's life with with a place because we、mm -hmm. experience places within a particular time. Uh, in our life, and I think it's very hard to separate those. It's very,、mm. very frequently we understand certain things and we associate them with, frequently wrongly with the place,、mm -hmm. uh, while it's actually about ourselves.、And、that being said, I think objectively, of course, the fact that New York attracts so many different people all the time. There's just so much going on.、Mm -hmm. Then it's up to your ability to be a good curator to have the best experience because you can go to probably the worst concert in the world and the best concert in the world in the、mm -hmm. same night, and、True. that's exciting. Yeah. There's always something to do. It's interesting too. I think that's the have the tie together with the experience、uh, because I do. I I love New York, but I feel like I definitely know friends who have hated it. It's really like I agree with you. That's really what you make of it and what you take from it, how you decide to experience it. Did you have a lot of pieces performed in Latvia? Yes. In fact, I have more pieces performed in Latvia than、uh, when I had when I was living there. But that again has to do simply with. The stage of my career and, and how、yeah. young I was because it's been good ten years now that I I haven't lived there. The last year I I won their national arts prize and、uh, that kind of brought a lot of it opened a lot a lot of doors and I've been doing four major projects and and next year there there are a few more so it's 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 exciting to develop this bicontinental、mm -hmm. uh, life. It's been it's been thrilling but it's also. At times, it's a little bit frustrating because、uh, my my friends and and my colleagues and people here don't know very much about what I'm doing over there, and likewise, people from Europe, it's it's harder for them to follow to the things that I'm doing here,、mm. and I almost feel like people have a completely different impression of, of what kind of music I write, which has nothing to do with me trying to think about a particular audience. It's just that you know I write many different pieces and. The ones that have been performed in Europe、mm. and the ones that have been performed here, for some reason, seem to paint a completely different picture of of who I am. So I yeah, I've been developing a certain kind of schizophrenia, if you will. <laughs> yeah, it almost、oh. sounds like two two careers, or you know, the same type of career, but in two different. Yeah,、uh, and I'm, I'm, there's I think and think I think there is a part in every human being that wants to bring your experiences together of whatever they are. It's like when you、mm -hmm. have、uh, disparate friend groups all over the world or in different cities. You kind of there's this secret hope inside of your head that they'll someday meet.、And、sometimes it works. Sometimes yes, yeah, <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't because they're again from different times of your life. Yeah, most likely. Yeah, and then you realize that you have changed. You have become a、That's、different a, person.、Yeah. There's been many, I'm sure, tragic brunches out there, but this has tried to happen, and it's just ended in tears <laughs>、like、and spilled mimosas.、That's, I feel like that's a very New York idea. Tragic <laughs> brunch. I love. I'm glad you mentioned all the different types of pieces you have written because let me tell you, you have written for everything from what I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanted to touch back on the comment you made about trying to merge. Parts of yourself together. Have you? Are there any pieces that you've specifically, purposely tried to do that? That was like a very direct result of that. I think my latest orchestra piece, Crossing, seems to do something of that sort.、Mm -hmm. Largely because it's one of the. I mean, I wrote it a year ago, so it's already. It's after I've had a few major performances on on both continents. It feels to me that. At least in my mind, again, these are all ideas that have very little basis in reality, as most of our ideas、uh, mm -hmm. do. But I think any time I, I I write music for for this, I guess, country at large, the pieces simply tend to be more tonal. Again, that's probably not the best way to put it. They tend to have a a more concrete center of some sort,、mm -hmm. so not necessarily tonal in the in the kind of eighteenth century. Uh, sense, but but more that they maybe modal sometimes is a better word, but that they have a center, a pitch center that that everything circulates、mm -hmm. around, as opposed to pieces that have been performed in Europe. They they somehow tend to be a little more,、um, uh, perhaps a little less centric,、mm -hmm. and I don't really know what it has to do with. Maybe yeah, I can't really put my finger on it. And then crossing seemed to be that one piece where. I'm somehow doing both things because I, I start. I have a completely different starting point. I,、mm. I start with with a motive. That's a very unusual thing for me to do. Anyway, I was still there in that piece as just, just like in all of my other pieces.、Uh, there's a certain form of restraint, but but I've changed the 
parameters that I'm that I'm limiting. Usually, it's mm. usually my harmonic language is very, very, very limited. I, I spend quite a lot of time finding harmonic grid or harmonic place that I mm. like to be in, and then I largely build a single piece around one of those little things. Mm. Uh, in crossing, it's more like there's there's a certain motivic relationship, um, six six pitches that are distributed in a very particular way, and then the whole piece grows out of it. But it ends up entering completely different um, rhythmic, modal, tonal character uh, territories. That that if you don't listen closely, they almost seem like they're not related at mm -hmm. all. Um, but it takes like once you hear it, it's a little bit like um, illusions, optic illusions. In which you, uh, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think with in, in this piece, it works in a similar way. If you listen to it somewhat mindlessly, you'll get a, a one experience. And if you once you know what it's built off, you'll you'll never be able to to hear anything else in that piece. It feels almost obsessive with with that idea fix, if you will. That it sounds a little uh -huh. like the the concept of aphasia. I think it's the word. Uh, it's not. It's not aphasia. It's uh, apathenia. Ooh, I actually do not for. know what that is. I believe that's a term when you see faces in uh, random uh -huh. designs. And then when you once you see it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. So but that just seems to be a human feature rather than uh Yeah, I think and, it's just yeah. like a psychological right. way to I process mean we look the... at clouds all the time and see all kinds of faces. I think that's the same yeah. I think it's all the same thing. <laughs> so this this piece is for orchestra mm -hmm. and it won the Earshot reading, correct? Yes, yeah. So it was originally uh, written as a part of uh, the Aspen Festival Commission uh, from the uh, Jacob Druckmann Prize. Yeah, then it did the Earshot, and now we have uh, Atlanta is doing it in January of oh, nice. next year. Uh, but I've been revising it extensively for each each one of those. So the ending that's that's online is very different from all the other endings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting how with this piece I've been constantly trying to find a better and better ending because it has a certain um, mercurial way of proceeding mm -hmm. that doesn't let you finish, uh, which is a very typical problem for all minimalist pieces. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is not a, a typical minimalist piece in any sense, yet it retains one thing, which is the problem of, of finishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would say I love that. I love that when a piece can evolve or it changes over time. So it's not just one and done you know, something you might realize years later for a piece and just have to say, oh, I have to go, I have to go change this like right now. Yes, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's it. I must say that I have a hard time with that. Usually I tend to, I tend to like to just move on. Uh, mm. That's partially, partially, I think a psychological state of uh, where it's just not easy to enter the same mental space again uh, because it feels so complete. But maybe there's something to be said about me uh, entering my late 20s and gradually, uh, maybe my my brain evolves uh, at a different rate, and it's mm -hmm. actually it's no longer a problem to go back a year and feel like I can understand who I was and what I was trying to accomplish. While mm -hmm. five years ago, it would have been very difficult because I would look at it and feel like it's not a piece I even wrote. I feel like I have been in a similar mindset with pieces, especially things that have had like a very strict deadline. And if it's a tight <laughs> deadline and I get it done, I have that huge sense of it's finished. And then it's hard. I sometimes I feel like to go back to that. I will say that I listened to this piece and I loved it. But Thank you. Specifically, what I loved was your orchestration. And I will say this just across the board, blanket statement, your orchestration is incredible. I was getting, whether or not this was intentional or not, but I definitely was getting a very strong like Debussy or Ravel vibe from Crossing. Mm -hmm. And I just want to talk a little bit about what your approach is to orchestration or what other pieces or composers have inspired or in, in, informed your, your approach to mm -hmm. orchestration. Yeah, I I got it a lot uh, after the first performance. Um, uh, exactly what you said, the, the Debussy and Ravel connection. I think it's interesting because I come from a very, um, I don't, well, how, how should I say this? Uh, I, I don't think I've ever studied orchestration uh, in, in a kind of formal way. I've mm -hmm. taken orchestration classes, but they've never been structured in this in this textbook way. Um, and, and any textbook I've looked at, I've been, uh, I, I think they're a little bit funny. I'm sorry to say any textbook on orchestration mm -hmm. that's written because of course, orchestration is all about sound and using your ears. And, and so I think 
I'm a big fan of ear training and, and, and hearing uh, of, of any sort. Uh, and I think the development of, of that has helped me maybe more uh, in orchestration than, than any formal orchestration class mm-hmm. I've ever taken. So what I do, first of all, I write everything always in the score. I, I, I'm not a believer in, in, in short scores or, or, or writing for piano and then mm-hmm. orchestrating. The or- orchestration is not a separate act from composition for me. It goes hand okay. in hand. I start, mm-hmm. I start writing in the orchestra. Second, I also have a certain sonic image that then I'm trying to translate into the orchestra. So that kind of contradicts my previous statement where I say it's not a separate process, but in that regard, (laughs) it is. And finally, I think I'm trying to really understand the acoustic reality. What, you know, how instruments sound, it's just, it becomes very rational thinking. So, Mm -hmm. so especially when you, when you're not composing, you're really, um, when you're not using your creative mind, you can sort of look at it rationally and, and think about sound synthesis within an orchestra mm-hmm. um, in this way that's that's highly logical, I think, and it involves, I think, perhaps more your uh, your left side of the brain than than the rest of the mm-hmm. process. And I enjoy that very much because I I love to cultivate uh, both sides of my brain. I love um, I love rational thinking. I'm a big fan of of a lot of um, scientific approaches mm-hmm. to music. That being said, I don't use it ever dogmatically. I'm not interested in establishing a method or mm-hmm. I, I just borrow infinitely from, uh, from other modes of, of human thought, uh, philosophy, especially that's probably the first one I should have mentioned. Do you find that you just naturally tend to approach pieces or write pieces that do incorporate both sides of the brain in terms of, you know, you might focus on the structure one way, but then the, maybe like you said, the orchestration seems fairly intuitive. Do you, do you typically attempt to blend those or does it just happen? I think it just happens given mm-hmm. the, I, I think we're, you know, once we, of course there's, there's a period where you have to develop all kinds of skills, but once we, once we have the basic set of skills, whatever that is, I'm not going to try to define that. I think there is a point at which you, if you just let yourself be who you are and, and that statement is, is infinitely more complex than it might sound at first, because I think it's so easy to, to cover ourselves with 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 uh, with the society, to cover ourselves with with ideas, to cover ourselves with with things that we haven't really arrived at ourselves, to to enter certain realms of of ideas without knowing that we're actually promoting uh, other people's agendas. So I, what I'm talking about is is looking at ideas and sounds truthfully by being very highly critical uh, of, of, of any idea that enters our mind. And I think then once you see that that in some sense sound is just what it is uh, and, and that very frequently we tend to think about it not in the way that it is. Mm-hmm. We tend to think about it with all, the, all this baggage. And I think that baggage very frequently holds us back from, from really diving in uh, the sound. Uh, and I don't really, I know that in the moment I said sound itself, people will be thinking of of Cage, uh, which is certainly not an influence of mine in almost any way, but of course his best friend Morton Feldman is is my favorite composer. And his orchestration, his thinking about sound has been highly, highly influential on, on my thinking about sound and my thinking about music and my thinking about relationship between philosophy and music. That being said, again, I don't think my my music sounds very much like Feldman's music, which I'm very very happy about. I think that's that's that kind of relationship that that I'm looking for is is being affected by by a certain mode of thought and yet digesting it in a completely personal way. Trying to develop your own sound or not sounding like another composer, I think, is as equally scary as it is rewarding. I feel like you you really don't get the most out of your compositions if you're not trying to be as authentic as possible. But I feel like that does take a lot of emotion and sometimes it happens easier for others, but sometimes it takes a while for, I feel like people to find it. So I think the fact that you are really honing in on that and really making that a focus is I'm sure a great testament to why that you are so successful in all of the pieces and that you've been writing and all of the different ensembles you've been getting to write for. Thank you. Yeah. I think that, that for me, it's, it's all about, it goes hand in hand with, Ultimately, yes, honesty towards your, yourself as well. It's it's a back and forth because you look inside of a piece of music and you see where you're where you're where you have. I, I'm very psychoanalytic in reading pieces in general. I, I I love looking at it and seeing where I think I'm developing certain 
modes of defense mechanisms where I feel insecure about uh, asking mm. people to sit through a 90 second silence. And then instead of that, I end up writing a uh, highly virtuosic and fast material. I think that's like a, one, one of the first things I notice in pieces of music. And I, I have a hard time not interpreting it as, as something that's, that's highly defensive where we're not mm. comfortable with, with things that we we're afraid that people will not like, or people will, will criticize or people will yeah, be damaging in some other capacity. I think we have to develop a certain center within ourselves that that lets us do courageous things. I feel like it, it ties back into more like to everything. It's just the the confidence, like you said, the courage to do it. So I think those are not easy to do. <laughs> no, <they're, they're, laughs> I feel like I struggle with those hard. a lot. So. <laughs> but I will say I do. I loved the way you put it when you mentioned baggage because I never had thought about that in that way until right now, and it was like. I was hit with this wave of like, oh my gosh, that's so brilliant. But it is true because I feel like when you are writing, it, it, it's easy to fall back on what is this instrument supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Is this correct? And yes, there are, there's advice to how to use different instruments. But when you mentioned focusing on the sound itself, I think it's very easy to, to not do that. So I'm going to steal that idea <laughs> from you. It's and... not my idea. <laughs> I'm not that, not, not that original, really. It's, I, I, there are quite a few people who have probably said that particular well, you version can take, of that. You can idea. take credit. Okay. I will gladly uh, <laughs> copyright. I feel well, like you said something else that was very interesting, but, um, taking to having courage, having courage and confidence and that's Rewinding right. in my head it's not meant to be if it, if it pops in your head <laughs> right. i want you to scream out loud interrupt <laughs> right. anything else that's I'll happening sure. and say this is what i want to share right now and then we'll just go back and add it in earlier <laughs> that's the that's the wonder of okay. podcasting yes because you can slice live. it together whatever way you want <laughs> going back to your ability to write for such different ensembles and very different types of pieces the other one I wanted to dive in a little bit into is piano. This was, I'm going to brag a little bit for you right now. This was mentioned in the New York Times, not too shabby, <laughs> as being the week's best classical music moment. That is amazing. One of the eight, to be perfectly clear. <laughs> eight moments of all musical <laughs> moments? I feel like that's pretty amazing. What I really loved about this piece is, this is going to sound silly, but it was the experience of listening to it, which I think that sounds very like, Duh, it's music. But what I mean is that the title's piano. I knew it's for piano quintet. And I'm going to be very honest, I did not realize I had heard a piano until f f too far in the piece before I realized the piano had been playing. I love that because it seemed, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, you can say, Michael, shut up. You know nothing about what you're talking about. You're a fraud. And I will walk out right now. <laughs> and you can take over interviewing Will or something. But from my experience listening to it, the strings seemed like an extension of the piano and the fact that the piano was woven into the the opening really percussive pizzicato sounds and then you had a chord come in and it really struck me oh piano that's how i interpret it that could be completely wrong but i wanted to hear it straight from you as to what your inspiration for the piece was and what what your idea was when you were structuring it that feels like a, a highly personally introverted piece that I, I i like it very very much it's it's it always returns in my my own uh, to, to be my own favorite piece every almost every year i have a moment where i think wow i wish i could write anything else like this but i've it's it's so far away it's so it's so distilled and stripped mm -hmm. from anything else i i think it again has to do with with where i am in my life i think at that point it was very it was such a turning point in my life moving from europe to the u.s I think I was very pure in my in my um, in my whole being. I think it was a very very truthful time in my life, and it's. I think it gets harder when we get older because we know more, and knowing is hard. That's. <laughs> well, I think one of the things about writing that piece was that I really did not know where it was going to go. Okay. Uh, I I did know that I loved Major Seventh, uh, probably from my extensive listening to Feldman and Webern's uh, Opus 27 piano variations. Second thing was that I was interested in in this this play of object and subject, something that I've never, I'm still 
inc- I, that's one of the most interesting topics for me, the definition of an object and a subject in any given situation, mm-hmm. and then interaction and possible connection between them. But in that piece, I think it really, first of all, it's so transparent that I think it's very easy to be with me. I'm, I'm completely naked in front mm-hmm. of my listener. And I love that. I think that's, that's something I strive for, but, uh, as I said, it's not easy to do. I, you are I, I don't braver know. than I am. That is <laughs> I really don't know how to do it. I think in that piece, somehow the circumstances were right, maybe, or I don't know. But there's also something about the entry of piano and that being an event that makes you feel like, no, the piano is the soloist and the, in the foreground. So you constantly go back and forth between this until, I mean, it, it, there's kind of a, it's an attempt at, at, at doing Zen, practically speaking, where you have to look at your own mind and decide, uh, you know, what's happening, what's really there and what is it that I'm doing as a listener to Mm. the piece. It really makes you hopeful for me. That's the experience. And I somehow hope that that's an experience for everyone. But of course, that's, that's a little bit of an impossible utopian goal. But I think when people come to me and they tell me that they realize something about their, the inner workings of their own brains and their own minds, I feel like that's, that's when the piece really did it. Uh, again, on a recording, maybe all of it doesn't come across because there is a little bit of a theatrical element where all the string players uh, prepare the next entry. Uh, that is, their bow is on the strings and they stop and they freeze. And for 90 seconds, you're watching them with their bows up, completely frozen. And what ends up happening is, of course, that our heart rates go up infinitely. We're just, it's its like the most stressful experience as opposed to, you know, how we, we associate silence with 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 peace, with meditation, with happiness, was was I don't know. Sometimes was the opposite. Sometimes with awkwardness and and with uh, with all kinds of negative things. And yet, in 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 a piece like this, I think you would think that silence would be the ultimate. And and yet, it's somehow there's something that's completely unknown because for first si- five seconds you think maybe it's a caesura or a longer rest. Uh, Ten seconds in, I think you've you've understood that something is going on, but you don't know what. Then twenty thirty seconds in you really know that it is an intentional silence. Maybe you still think that the piece is going to end, yet at that point you realize that you don't know. You're you're completely, you're not in control of your listening experience anymore because you don't, you would adjust to clap if you knew that it was the end of the piece. Mm-hmm. But at this point, you really no longer know what if they start playing. And if they start playing, what is it going to be? Because suddenly you become very conscious of the, minimalistic nature of the material so mm-hmm. how do you how do you break that silence how do you break that that ice and i very much like the the, the solution that that i came up with and in that particular piece it's it's just the most minimalist version of everything it's simply the string instruments sustaining those major sevens that they received at the very beginning that they just hold them all the way through till the end all eight of them at the same time so it's an undecided ending but i think the poetry that 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 ends up happening in something like that, where you're really uh, everybody's allowed to participate and everybody's is really on the same page somehow. Mm-hmm. It's it's magical, and I'm I'm I think I'll be grappling with with that piece for a very long time because I don't want to write another piece like that because I think it just did exactly what it needed to do, mm-hmm. and that's not a feeling that a composer, of course, always gets. That's amazing because I feel like that's not easy to get to and i'm sure there are people that never get to that point i feel like i'm 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 surely not there myself and i feel like that has to be such an amazing feeling to know that you've expressed something completely from your you know from yourself and it's as authentic as it possibly can be and i love the fact that you mentioned the the sense of zen and and silence because i love theater i love drama (laughs) all kinds no Our listeners didn't see your your mouth open after that, which made it. I was very excited about drama. You need to take a photo down. and and post it on oh, the post. Instagram. <laughs> we probably do need to post something. You made a really very astute point about silence because silence does seem to be very contextual. In that silence only, at least to me, feels comfortable when you're in a comfortable space. So if I'm sitting in at home or I'm sitting somewhere where I feel that the silence is almost controlled to an extent, then it's very peaceful. But in a concert, you are somewhat bound to the expectations of what it is to be in a live performance. And we we talk a little bit about this on on another episode, but in that sense, because you're not familiar with a long silence in the middle of a piece and you don't know what's going to happen, I completely agree with you that you're going to have a sense of not just anticipation, but a little bit of 
anxiousness because you don't know, did they forget? Which, you know, or did, <laughs> you don't know. I mean, that's very unlikely, yes, but it's yeah, just it's yeah. that unknown part. Just like you mentioned, it sets up the reward at the end. Mm-hmm. And then it, I'm sure it all clicks after that point. You're like, oh, that's what that was all for. Keep at it is what I'm saying. Keep, <laughs> oh, keep writing the way you were. Thank you. <laughs> As I was going through the different pieces, I was trying to pick things uh, that were a little bit not only different ensembles, but but in different concepts, possibly. The piece I wanted to get some of your insights on is Neo Arctic, especially because it's so different. The fact that it's you have all these moving parts. It's 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 vocalists, it's instrumentalists, it's stage. There's so many things that are happening, but there's also the visuals. There is the the electronics. What you didn't mention is that there's also a, it's co-composed with a techno producer Andy Stott. Uh, so there's uh, half of the music is actually his. Uh, so all the all the clearly techno sounding uh, parts are, are are his. So maybe the music is uh, not that different after got all. Got it. Uh, that being said, I did make uh, quite a few tracks with electronics, and the fact that it is a staged work, the fact that it has all these limitations, starting with the text up until that, I I, I try still not to set text really uh, to music. I only I love texts very much. Mm-hmm. I have high appreciation and, and even beyond that love for, for certain texts. I, I, I like either using one, two, three, four or five words from a single text and then repeat them endlessly or let that become dramatic that the emergence of a single word or in, in my most recent pieces, I'm actually accompanying my pieces with many, many texts, but, but they're never, they're never sung. They're never seen by the audience. They're usually there uh, either in the score for the performer uh, in one of the pieces oh. for contemporaneous last year, we everybody had to memorize certain texts, and before we went into the rehearsal, we would recite the poetry and then rehearse. Uh, so it's kind of all about creating a mental space for the rehearsal and bringing that energy to the piece, but then it's never spoken about uh, afterwards, kind of like a secret uh, society um, of, um, manner. Mm-hmm. So do you feel that the overall performance is not exactly explicitly what the audience is perceiving, but it's a part of what's going through the performers' heads, you know, what they're feeling about the piece. You could, Do you consider that the ultimate goal of the performance as opposed to just, you know, performing it for the audience? And that's the perception that they have, and that's that's the whole experience. Yes and no. I think the moment when it is being presented to an audience is still the, the real moment of birth, the ultimate moment of birth. That being said... Spatially speaking, not only what is going on in audiences' head matters. I think what's going on in the performers' head heads uh, matters as much. So yeah, New Arctic was it was difficult in many many ways because of all those restrictions and because how, of course, as composers, we want to have as much control of things as as we possibly can. And for something like this, I had very very little control, especially of a form, which is something that I'm quite rigid about. Mm-hmm. Do you tend to set a form ahead of time? And no, but okay. but I think ultimately I feel um, that that my forms evolve in a certain way from their materials. There's there's some, it's very I mean it's that's highly romantic thinking right there, uh, but that doesn't mean that the form doesn't matter. It just means that it's I I feel like I want my form to be honest to whatever is being said mm-hmm. forms, and I don't feel like I can frame anything before I actually know what that something is. So I think there is a certain kind of relationship. But for me, to be really honest, I think at this point, my materials or at least concepts precede uh, form mostly. To have someone come in and say, no, no, it needs to be shorter or it needs to be longer or it needs to do this or it needs to do that. That experience uh, felt uh, like it, it invades something very, very personal and something that that's uh, that that really loses something once it's being touched by someone mm-hmm. else or loses is a little bit of a dramatic word it just changes it in a way that it becomes a little bit of uh there's there's too much chaos in the best way possible where mm-hmm. where you just no longer know what it's going to be it still doesn't mean it's going to be bad it's just i i can't guarantee that it's going to be what i think it will be mm-hmm. it becomes uh, it, it, it becomes open suddenly everybody can step in um and that's interesting. Sometimes I think things can happen in that way. But for me personally, I think my my process is so personal and intimate that mm-hmm. that uh, even when when sometimes I, I share something about the pieces that I'm working on with with anyone in my daily life, and they say one thing wrong, it's it's 
it becomes destructive. It becomes mm -hmm. it becomes this thing that that then changes the course of the piece in a way that's that's not again honest to 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 the piece itself. Okay, it sounds like you are putting a lot of trust in yourself. You, when you start, you're very trusting that it it's going to go exactly the way that you want it to, or that it has to. I like that because that make that does make it very intimate. And at that point, it's almost that there is no wrong way it could go because you it's coming from yourself, which I feel probably has its. Well, maybe this is me thinking again of me doing something like that. So this could be just my perception of it, but it sounds very terrifying to me. <laughs> so I give you a lot of props <laughs> for doing that, but it does seem that that is such a great way to go about it. And I'm just very impressed. And it's, this all seems like I'm imagining as an evolution, like you mentioned, the you know, from the person you were before to the person you are now. But to get that level of trusting in yourself, it's not an easy thing, I don't think. And I feel like that's that, that you should get a lot of credit for that. It's it. <laughs> takes a lot of listening and listening is really hard mm -hmm. once you realize that that your mind is very very loud and that quite a lot is going on and and that you're unbearable <laughs> you know then then you start going somewhere because you you start making real changes i i tend to retreat to these highly religious terms like like cleansing or purification you can you can arrive at a certain kind of mm -hmm. that that's the only way to change your music really because if you do it externally then your music is not in alignment with who you are you yeah once you change yourself your music changes with it and mm -hmm. i think that's the only real for me at least that's the only possible way for doing that it's it's constantly finding uh, who i am and understanding that it's, it changes from moment to mm -hmm. moment and that i have to be true to that and that i have to respond to that do you find that it's easier for certain types of writing than others or, or certain writing for certain types of ensembles like choir versus a percussion piece or orchestra? Or do you find that that holds true for everything? I think it does hold true for everything. I, I At least in terms of instruments, I think maybe there's certain time scales that simply are hard. I think very short pieces are very, very hard um, because the way I think about things is very slow. It's very, I take a very long time to think about something mm -hmm. and it evolves and develops. And when I have to put that in, it's, it's a little bit like I can't provide the right context for something. So when a four minute piece will be played amongst all these other pieces, it it might, you know, it's very hard to, to understand what it is. It's almost as if you cut a little fragment from something. And I like to provide mm -hmm. a little bit of the, either journey or context or, or there has to be a little bit of of light shining on it so that it's not mm. two-dimensional space it suddenly becomes at least three-dimensional mm. hopefully more so do you do you, do you feel more comfortable with with longer i tend pieces? to veer in that that direction uh, especially these days that uh, i think 10 minutes is a is a good beginning mm. uh, but but i i love writing longer works i i there's just something about it almost takes care of of so many it, it takes care of so many things naturally because you're anybody who sits down for a little longer than 15 minutes starts to slow down naturally and start to just accept things more easily and i think that at that point you're you're uh, listening to it I, I feel like you become more aligned with with my uh, view of the world somehow inevitably just because things slow down and, and 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 there's a certain kind of focus that's not not the kind of modernist focus where you have to count notes but it's more like you're just highly attuned to what's going on uh mm. you're you're really in touch with with i don't know maybe that uh that place in between subject and object where they meet that's unresolved well that's a good question do you think that things like that exist objectively or more is it important that it ex exists for you pick one I mean, no, I can't. Well, we can skip I, that question. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm highly like the doubtful. I, I don't really know. I think I'm, I'm, in, I'm I, I constantly switch back and forth. Mm. I think I, I, I have a strong belief in in human minds uh, and their capacities uh, and their their infinite capacities, really. And that's that's really really interesting to me. How logically, and I think logic and rational thought, reason is. Is still one of the best and, and most magnificent tools that that we have as a, as a humanity. That being said, I'm you know I I, I chose to become uh, I, I chose to go in, into into arts and and so clearly there's there's a part in me that also 
seek something that that goes beyond that mm-hmm. or that's able to operate on on a different frequency or or that can tell us something about the human experience that's that does not conform to reason necessarily so so again there's already some sort of dualism mm-hmm. between that kind of enlightenment uh, classical and romantic mindset that's and i think both of them are always inside of me and they always fight and and it's a it's a stimulating fight yeah it, it sounds like it's coming back to that left brain right <laughs> brain yeah, situation yeah, as well yeah. so i think that yeah i love that you're you're channeling the conflict <laughs> <laughs> so i know that you have tons of projects on your plate but what are some of the things that are coming up on the horizon the first one now in, in june is uh this work i did for the prague quadrennial which is a visual arts uh, symposium I'm, I just finished a piece literally a few hours ago. Uh, oh. uh, that, well, I finished it a few days ago, but there's uh, highly technical drawings that I had to submit with it mm-hmm. uh, because it's for uh, it's for this instrument that's being built right now. Oh, uh, it's, wow! It's it's like large music box slash tubular, tubular bells. So it has 32 notes, but it's really it's closer to like uh, a glockenspiel or vibraphone, but it's huge. Oh, and wow. that's it's underneath the space that these uh, amazing Latvian artists, uh, Krista and Renis Dudzillo, uh, this, this wonderful couple, they're they're building, uh, and it's there to 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 represent Latvia in, in the uh, Prague Quadrennial. And so I wrote a piece that will be on loop uh, infinitely for these two weeks, I think. Oh, wow. uh, um, so it's an installation, really, in which you can enter, but underneath you, there's there's this live music. Uh, playing and you're kind of in touch with it so someone's playing the instrument no it's it's automatic it's mechanic oh i was gonna say like either they're having like shifts or someone is just really hopped up on a lot of caffeine no but 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 somebody has to punch uh nearly three thousand holes at highly specific places in 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 plywood uh, or or some other form of wood so that's that's going to be exciting. That's a, Will actually has a, a music box kit around here where you punch holes in the strip of paper. So oh, wow. It's really yeah. fun to, to yeah. mess around with. Yeah. So this is like a blown up version of that. That's, <laughs> that's the, amazing. Yeah. So were, were you a part of the conversation of the instrument itself or was it something where they're like, this is what it's going to be. Here's what you well, the need concept to is for. largely theirs. Uh, there's it's it's all about time and space. It comes from this moment in Parsifal uh, where where time becomes space. There's the the famous line. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it in German, even though the project is is named after that particular phrase. But it literally means here time becomes space, or the other way around. But either way, it's it's one becomes the other. Makes sense. The theory ways. of relativity before mm-hmm. it was postulated. So that also there's a little bit of Parsifal sort of seeping through in my in in my score. That's just again very very unusual for me as well. I haven't done anything like this, mm-hmm. and it was interesting that this instrument was built specifically for this piece. It can't do anything else. Uh, even the range was built just based on what I what I wrote. So it's interesting to see how, in some sense, composers always, of course, uh, manifest the the mental world into the physical. But this is almost an extreme version of that, where whatever I came up with is is now manifest not in the sound only, but also in the physical space. So make sure I'm understanding correctly. Yeah. So you, they had the concept for the instrument, but they basically created the range off of what you wrote yes, for the piece. Yes, that is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like that's yeah. that's incredible because I feel like that's what an experience to, to write something that the instrument has to change. <laughs> yes, for. yeah. It's that's very, pretty it's amazing. It's very, very exciting. And I still don't know what it's going to be like. And it was a it was a very, very special process because there were all these limitations because of the mechanics, because it's not digital, it's purely mechanical, mm-hmm. uh, which is, of course, infinitely more fascinating, I think, for, for me at least. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that's that's going to come out. Do you have anything coming up in New York or anything? In New York, there's quite a few things in the fall. Uh, there's a piano piece that I wrote for David Fung. He will premiere it and 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 play it uh, many times, I believe. Uh, but I don't have specifics of mm-hmm. it. I'm also writing two new pieces for one for uh, the Amalgam Ensemble. It's a uh, it's an evening length piece. And the unheard of trio as well. I'm writing a smaller 10 minute piece. And in October in Riga, in my hometown, I have a 40 minute guitar trio for guitar, saxophone, and drum set. Oh, nice. Uh, it's kind of based on a classical piano trio model, but but it's for these basically I jazz instruments and jazz musicians. Mm. 
well, we'll have to make sure that we mm-hmm. we post when when some of the dates get settled so that uh, yes, we'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah, this, that's a little too far for uh, some of them. I I know already, but mm-hmm. some of them are still up in the air. I'm just gonna say this has been an amazing experience getting to hear your experience as a composer, and, and I'm just gonna say you have given me life. You're give, you're giving me life. <laughs> And inspiring me to read to be a lot more critical about the way that I write. So well, thank you, Michael. I, You've been, uh, I mean, you you know you created the space where I felt comfortable to say oh, all these hoping, things. And you, you I was said, hoping uh, I didn't come across as too menacing. No, not at all. You were you were you know you made it you made it very comfortable. Oh, I'm glad and, this went so well. We're best and friends. And you asked down, really right? really uh, really insightful questions, which is uh, which is uh, you know oh. probably more important than. Ooh, um, keep going, please. <laughs> You can't see me waving you gave, myself. But... You gave me water. <laughs> we did. We did provide water. <laughs> Nothing else. This is, it's a very austere setting. It's just a room and a table. <laughs> well, I want to say thank you so much for coming. Thank you here to to talk with us. We this is one of my favorite fun. parts of doing this is getting oh. to meet new people. And again, this is amazing for me to be interviewing someone that I don't know because it's <laughs> it's like a blank canvas, and I feel like I know you a little bit more, but I feel like I want to hear a lot Still more. Pretty of blank. <laughs> No, it's because of the blank face. No, you're very, very expressionful. <laughs> and that, folks, was my interview with composer Chris Osniak's. We'll be back next week with our regular format with a discussion and an interview, so definitely stay tuned. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and give us a rating. It helps boost our visibility. Also, check out our Patreon page and give us a little bit of support if you can. Next up, we're going to play a little bit from Chris's piece, Fire and Rose. So we hope you enjoy. Until next time.
Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to give you a handshake because I feel like that's how you should end a, an right. interview. We can. Make we it can. official. Yes. This that was, was it. great. Wow. Thank you. Can I just say that? <laughs>